stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning and welcome to the August 4th County Commission meeting and to remind you to silence your cell phones. The meeting documents are on the end of the counter next to Commissioner Bender and Robert has listening devices for you in the front row if you need that. And with that we'll go on with routine business. Item number one is consider a motion to approve the agenda. So move. Second. A motion and a second. Any changes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed same sign. Motion passes unanimously. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, item number two is approve the county commission meetings, minute meetings, mi county commission meetings, and the joint county city meeting minutes from 728-2015. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. A motion and a second. Any changes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number three is bills to be paid in the amount of $537,611.25. Is there a motion? So move. Is there a second? second? Motion and a second. Any comments? No comments. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number four is reports. There are none. Item number five is personnel. Item A is consider a motion to approve the routine personnel actions. Motion. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to, to approve routine actions. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number B is recognize significant employee anniversaries for August. Good morning, Carrie Deaver from Human Resources. I have a small but impressive list for you today. We have two individuals celebrating five years of service, Cynthia Jepson, who is the commission recorder in the auditor's office, and Carol Muller, who is your newly appointed commission administrative officer, and both are here today. Any comments? Okay. Um, <laughs> such an opportunity passed up. We're still thinking about that one. <laughs> um, and then we have two individuals from the JDC celebrating 15 years of service, Rob Knutson and Nathan Croce, and Preston Evans, who's a sergeant in the sheriff's office, is celebrating 25 years of service. All right. Um, and the next one is item C, recognize volunteers in county departments for July 2015. Another large list, almost 300. We're at 269 um, uh, individuals volunteering in over nine departments within county. Okay. And we do want to recognize those people, our employees who sit up here at the desk with us or sit in our audience with us or are working about and our volunteers, that it does make the county run smoothly and I appreciate the dedication that you have to this county. So, okay. Item number D is a special commission action to approve the compensation adjustments to address marketing issues. You know that for the past month or so we've been discussing some market issues related to the pay for our attorneys. Um, I've had several discussions in budget and what we're noticing is that our, our base wages are lagging market. And when I say noticing, it, it's something that was brought up last year during our compensation study. This year, as we've continued to look at it, we're seeing that our numbers and the disparity between market and our wages are widening. Um, we were 29% below market for private industries last year, and we know we're not going to compete with that. Um, but what's surprising to us is where we were at 6% below, maybe in the government. Some of our closest government comparisons, local areas, were now lagging market by over 9%. Um, we're noticing that that is having an impact on us, and for that reason, we're asking your consideration to take certain steps to address these market issues. You might remember right now, we have authority to go ahead and advertise a higher range if we have market issues like we have in this case. If we use that range, it's not going to be adequate in our opinion to address the problem. Plus, if we actually utilize that when hiring, it's not going to be practical because we'll be hiring new staff above what we're paying current, more experienced staff. So we're recommending two steps to take place immediately with your support. Uh, that is to utilize a new base salary of 59508 That is the fifth step in the plan, which is 21.6 as opposed to 21.5. And that is close to that average wage that we're seeing that market bears. In addition, we'd recommend utilizing the same four-step hiring range that we do right now when we advertise from step two to five, and in this case, advertise from 21.6 to 21.9. In addition, because of 
the problems that we would have actually utilizing those salaries for new staff. We're recommending a modest increase for some select attorney positions. And the reason we're doing that again is to ensure that nobody who's newly hired with less experience is paid more than a current employee with more experience. And you need to be aware that even if you do approve these adjustments, you're going to have what we consider to be compression issues. In other words, you're going to have a large portion of employees paid at the base, new base for those attorney positions. And when you promote some of those entry-level attorneys and they're ready to take on the felony load, you're going to have um, staff with several years difference in experience all earning the same rate of pay. <coughs> I think even though that, that's the case, it's a nice approach considering your fiscal constraints and making sure that we address the market issues that we have. We're going to recommend some select changes and step dates. Uh, in order to ensure that more senior, more experienced staff are eligible for increases before less experienced staff, but it's going to be compressed within probably a year. So with that, the adjustments that we'd be recommending is the new base is the 59508 Again, uh, we would recommend a one-step adjustment for any of the attorneys just at pay grade <coughs> 21 or 2 or 22 who are not at the maximum. That one-step adjustment, you'll still have compression, but it'll help alleviate the compression and it'll address the market issues. I should say here, too, we're focusing on base salary because that's where we're having difficulties in recruiting. But you have market issues with your attorney pay from base to maximum, so that'll help address some of that. If any of these individuals, the most anybody would receive under this plan is a 10% increase. That would be our newly hired people who are currently at 53,000. If we move them to the new base of 59.5, they'd be receiving a 10% adjustment. We we'll recommend resetting the step for those people to August 15th, which is our recommended implementation date. And again, the reason we would do that is to avoid leapfrogging. Um, in addition, we have a few select individuals who, because of how their steps fall, we would need to adjust slightly. So we're recommending your approval for that. And I've listed on the attached document for you those few select staff that we're recommending re-step or setting steps for that reason. The one adjustment that we have, or I'm recommending to you, that's outside the pay grade 21 and 22 is for Julie Hofer, who is our current public advocate. If her staff received the one-step adjustment, this is one case where we would have the supervisor or department head earning the same rate of pay as a staff member that she supervises. Again, we're suggesting a conservative approach by just a one-step or a two and a half percent increase for Julie. You have about 54 attorneys working for you on staff right now. Again, this does not impact anybody. It's just people at pay grade 21 and 22 and Julie Hofer. So it would impact about 44 people. You might recall that during budget discussions, we just looked at this and the impact for 2016. It is currently in your 2016 budget. If you wanted to approve the recommendations today to have them be effective, you'd be looking at an additional cost for 2015 of about $42,640. I've met with all three department heads to discuss the compression issues and the cost. All three are committed to trying to go ahead and recoup that through salary savings. And since all three departments have had turnover, there's some ability to go ahead and do that. Um, but I can't promise you they'd be able to recoup the whole thing. So I want you to be aware that if you do approve this, you might have a request for a supplement at the end of the year, particularly from the state's attorney's office. They've had three senior staff people retire during the last year, so that might be one area where we'll have some difficulties doing it. But all three department heads are committed to trying. Are there any questions for Carrie? Is there a motion? Make a motion to approve. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any other comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Item number six is applications for abatements. There are none. Item number seven is notices and requests. Item A is South Dakota Transportation Commission notice of hearing to review and adopt administrative rules for the county highway and the bridge improvement plan and the bridge improvement grant, the big fund, at 9 a.m. August 27th at the Becker Hansen Building Commission Room, 700 East Broadway Avenue, Pierce, South Dakota. Item number eight is planning and zoning notices. And this is the first reading and authorize the auditor to, to publish notice of a hearing on August 18th. Kevin, you want to finish out the legal description? Or do you want me to do it? Uh. 
uh, I'll just finish what yeah. we're doing here. Um, a hearing on August 18th, 2015 to consider rezoning number 15-05 from the A1 Agricultural District to the C Commercial District legal property legal description as Tract 3, except H1, and except south 260 feet of the west 300 feet of the Corral Edition, southeast one quarter, southeast one quarter, section 35, Township 101 North, Range 51 West, Wall Lake Township. All right, uh, yes, this is the Kevin Hookman County Planning and Zoning. This is a rezoning application um, and that needs to be uh, scheduled for a hearing date. Uh, the rezoning request is for this property that was described. It is located approximately three miles west of Sioux Falls and adjacent to the south side of Wildwater West um, uh, Amusement Park. Uh, the petitioners would like to re uh, are requesting to rezone approximately 18 acres of this 20.11 acres uh, parcel. Uh, the remaining portion of this would remain agricultural uh, in order to re keep a building eligibility on the site. And the, the 18 acres would be rezoned to commercial. Um, the hearing date uh, is scheduled to be uh, heard on August 18th of 2015, and that's what we'd like to publish in the paper for hearing date. So this is just an authorization for, for the auditor to publish notice of hearing. Is there a... Make a motion to authorize publication. Second. A motion and a second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Kevin. Item number nine is petition for compromise of lien. Commissioner Barth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is DPNO 51769 in the amount of $1,132. Uh, we've received this request uh, uh, from a, a party who would like to uh, dismiss this from her now ex-husband and keep it on her own uh, on her own to-do list. Um, she says that uh, they got some rental assistance in 2009, and uh, her husband is scheduled to ex-husband is scheduled to close on a home later this month, and uh, you know it's a home where he will live with their children, and uh, the the uh, amounts uh, involved again for rent were posted after their uh, divorce was final, and. Uh, uh, at, at that point, then, uh, our options of collecting uh, uh, from him uh, become less. And I guess I, I'm going to favor this and make a motion to accept taking uh, him off of this lien and leaving it in full against uh, the applicant. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. I believe the issue with this is that the um, the the money was taken specifically for her and it was after the divorce was final so he shouldn't right. have been on it in the first and, place and again he is getting a house to live with their children stage two if i may add to one of the issues with this too is that the lien was actually recorded in our office after the final date of the divorce too which is something i think you should consider too as to the enforcement but i would i would also concur in in the recommendation to to accept this proposal from the applicant I have a motion and a second to uh, um, to agree the proposal or the application of DPNO number 51769 to compromise $1,139 and leave the lien entirely upon the, the um, ex-wife. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Next one is opportunity for public comment. If there's anyone who would like to speak to the commission about anything that's not on the agenda. Okay. See none. We'll go on to regular business. Item number 10 is a public hearing to consider a motion to declare property legally described as the North 114th West 73rd Peterson Tract South Southwest 2nd Southwest 1 quarter Southwest 1 quarter 17 103 50 Lyons Township as a public nuisance and enact South Dakota codified law 20-10-6. Kevin Hookman. Uh, Kevin Hookman, County Planning and Zoning. 
Uh, as you heard, this uh, property is uh, a request to for a public nuisance declaration. And the property legally described as the north 114 feet of the west 73 feet Peterson's tract to number two, southwest quarter of the southwest quarter of 17-103-50 Lyons Township. On March 24th of two, this year, uh, staff received a complaint and was brought to aware of this property that a fire was, has burned uh, and that there is numerous unlicensed vehicles and barrels and other debris involved in this property. Uh, staff inspected the, the property on the next day, March 25th, and found that the complaint to be uh, true, that the fire was there and there's debris. Uh, after the staff inspected, uh, letters were sent. Um, the first letter was sent and there's no reply and no cleanup was done. A second letter was sent uh, and there was a reply from the property owner um, to which uh, we discussed what needed to be cleaned up and the possibility of looking at a timeline. Uh, and after that phone call was made, uh, no other contact was made by the property owner to planning staff. Uh, then the final letter was sent uh, and no reply was re heard from that either. Final letter was sent on June 12th of this year and no reply was heard and no um, uh, cleanup was done. Uh, so staff uh, sent a, a notice of hearing for today's meeting on July 21st of this year for today's date. Uh, and it was sent certified mail, a return receipt, and uh, we have not received the, the return receipt for the, the mail or yet. So, um, just to go over some photos of the property, um, this is what was inspected on March 25th, and you can see on the left of the screen that there's a, a dot of where I am looking at on the property and where it's going to, uh, where it's, the photo is looking. You can see the burned out uh, buildings and the barrels that are scattered in the lawn. Uh, the fire was big enough to uh, melt portions of the f first three vehicles there, as you can see. Some more pictures from that first inspection. Uh, and it burdened up uh, more or less all the unmowed portion of the grass is what it appeared to be um, and where the fire stopped. Uh, all the vehicles that are on the property have either no license plates or they are expired tags. Uh, this one is red, but it is a red tag from 2011. Um, other debris uh, that was there before the fire, not just the fire debris. Uh, this is close to the existing building there. Uh, and this would be the next inspection on April 15th. Uh, some of the barrels were consolidated, but little else has changed. Uh, then May 28th. Um, and you can see that the grass is starting to grow up in the in between the vehicles, but other than that, little else has changed. The barrels are still there. The vehicles have, are still there. Uh, June tenth. And then July tenth. Um, and this was after the, the final letter was sent. And at this point, uh, there's been weeds. This is a Canadian thistle that was there. Um, it was very tall, um, other weeds. The Minnehaha County's public nuisance uh, ordinance states that uh, a new, any and that abandoned property is a public nuisance, which is any deterior, 
deteriorated, wrecked, dismantled, derelict, or inoperable property in unusable condition in its present state and which has been left outside of an enclosed permanent structure. Without being so restricted, this shall include deteriorated, wrecked, inoperative, dismantled or partially dismantled or unlicensed motor vehicles, dilapidated or unregistered mobile homes, trailers, boats, machinery, refrigerators, washing machines or other appliances, plumbing fixtures, furniture, automotive parts, waste building materials, junk, and any other similar articles in such conditions. Uh, South Dakota codified law allows the county to declare a public nuisance to allow the county to clean up the property and defray the cost to the, public own, the property owner. So um, the staff's request is that uh, Minnehaha County declare this property as a public nuisance. And if you have any questions, I can take them. Yeah. Let's, um, this is a public hearing, so let's see. Is there any proponent? Is there any opponent? Okay, so then if there's questions for Kevin. Commissioner Barth? What was the nature of the one contact that uh, the department did have with the uh, property owner? So the property owner called uh, the the office, and when I talked to her, it was um, Tamara, um, and when I talked to her, she was uh, really wondering what was needed to be done, and I discussed that the commercial vehicles needed to be uh, that there cannot be any commercial vehicles so that uh, because it's an agriculturally zoned property and the vehicles needed to be either licensed or removed um, and then that the the debris from the fire needed to be, re be removed uh, it was recognized that after a fire like this that it can be difficult um, to get things cleaned up right away um, but uh, as you can see nothing has happened for quite some time now um, so and I, I, when I talked to her, um, we, I said, well, we can talk because she was wanting to talk to her husband about the timeline of when things can be cleaned up. And I said, well, if you make a proposal, we can work with that. And, and nothing came forward from that. So, so uh, while you were out there looking at uh, things, do you have any idea what was in those uh, steel drums? Was, it, uh, was there liquids, unknown chemicals, toxic waste, gas? So Oil. yesterday I did visit the site one last time uh, to make sure that nothing has changed since the last letter. Um, and I tapped on a few of the barrels. Uh, it appears to me that most of them are empty, actually. Uh, the, the one, I couldn't undo any of the lids without any tools, um, pry open them. Uh, but the ones that are open have dirty water and it looks like there may be oil in it, would be my guess. Thank you. Additional questions? Commissioner Kelly. Uh, I got four questions here, if you don't mind. When did the fire occur? The fire, oh, that was uh, announced in the initial email. It was like the 23rd of March. It was very shortly before the, the complaint. Of oh, this year? Of no, this last year. year. And uh, of this spring. Okay. Yep. Are, the, are the weeds, are, are the weeds an issue of the... Uh, condition. I mean, if they move all that stuff and leave the weeds, I, I mean, it looked like there was a nice house next door. And um, that is another portion of the public nuisance um, is vegetation uh, in a residential area. Um, although this is agriculturally zoned and is clearly in the residential area, uh, our, our subdivision, uh, the grass and weeds have to be mowed to a minimum, maximum of 12 inches high. Okay. Um, I noticed in um, one of the July 10th pictures that looks to me like a thistle. Yes. And are they, they're supposed to be removed, are they not? Yes. Okay. And then one other question, the autos. What, what, if we go in and clean it up, what do we do, impound the autos or? Uh, it is from what I, my understanding is we remove the the automobiles and they go to a, a dump or a, or a salvage yard from there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, research, you didn't receive a return receipt, so that means they did receive the letter. Uh, it, no, the re, uh, since I have not received the return receipt, uh, it, that means that they have not received a letter or they have not acknowledged the letter. No. Okay. Um, 
are they current on their property taxes on this piece of parcel at this point? Do we know that? That I don't know. That might be something interesting to know if they're just letting the property go anyway. And what exactly will we clean up? We'll move the vehicles, all the burn debris, the barrels, and mow the property. And there's a building on that property, and so that building will stay. Yep, and the building and everything in it would stay. And then all those costs would be assessed on their property taxes. It would be interesting to know, though, if they are paying property taxes at this point. Mm -hmm. so, any other questions? I guess when I read this, Kevin, I was thinking it had been a year ago, but it's only been uh, about six months. Yep. About Madam Chair, Commissioner Brown. you know, uh, really, uh, we have to wake up this uh, property owner and have this uh, thing taken care of. And uh, so I'm going to make a motion to declare this property a nuisance. And You're going to make a motion to what? To declare, declare this uh, property a nuisance and okay. to move forward. Uh, that said, I would hope that uh, we would continue efforts to contact and speak with uh, the property owner, but uh, they cannot... Uh, a delay uh, forever taking action. I I'll second that motion. I have a motion and a second to declare it a, a uh, public nuisance to enact um, cleanup. Kevin, I'm wondering how long before the cleanup would happen. Obviously, we would contact them again that this had been declared a public nuisance. They probably have, if they're really speedy, a week or two to get it cleaned up. About how long do you think before we would be ready to clean up? Uh, that would be depend on the contractor. Um, in previous uh, cases I looked up and we've used rungy um, demolition to, for cases like this and if they're really busy uh, it might be a little while before they can get to this site um, and they'd have more time to just really speedily clean it up or if they were um, not so busy they might be able to be there in a couple of weeks yeah and the vehicles that are on the property would be um, sold for scrap metal or whatever. Those funds would go towards paying for the expenses of the cl property cleanup? Um, I, I gathered that that goes uh, basically to paying the person who removes the, the vehicles. So the expense, of, yep. the expense of the cleanup. Yep. Are there any other questions? I have a motion and a second to declare a public um, nuisance and... Oh, taxes are current. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a motion and a second. Are there any other questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Kevin. Madam Chair, just would Burr. comment that, you know, if they were to be in touch with us on this and start a timetable uh, to clean things up, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be adversarial. We can work together to get this done. Item number 11 is also a public hearing and second reading of the Minnehaha Cardin County Ordinance MC number 47-15, an ordinance for permitting requirements of utilities crossing highways under Minnehaha County jurisdiction. T.J. Boothy. Except for I think we have Shannon Schultz. Good morning, Shannon. Good morning, Commissioner. Shannon Schultz, Assistant Highway Superintendent. P.J. is attending some family matters uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this week. Speak up a little, please, Sean. So this is the second reading, and uh, item 12 is also closely tied to this. And uh, I guess I just want to briefly read from our guidebook. One introductory paragraph. And I think it's that's the ethic and intention of what we're trying to do with this uh, new ordinance. It is in the public interest for utility facilities to be accommodated on highway right-of-way when such use and occupancy do not adversely affect highway safety, construction, maintenance, and operations. In this respect, guidelines outlining safe and rational practices for accommodating utilities within highway right-of-way are valuable assistance to transportation agencies. The guidelines herein are provided in the interest of developing and preserving safe highway operations and road sites. So that's kind of a very good overview. Uh, in practice, we have been doing utility permits in the past. Very little teeth in them, uh, lack of uh, county ordinance support, and we've not been charging a fee. So by enacting this ordinance, we would be authorized to charge a fee, uh, very minimal fees for most utilities, for example, service lines for houses, water lines, cables. Um, but it gives us some teeth when something big is happening and, and there's potential long-term um, issues with maintenance of our roadways. So uh, the permit is 
uh, about three pages, the average applicant will fill out approximately a third of that because it is a comprehensive permit and it covers everything from overhead to uh, utilities crossing on bridges and as well as underground. So uh, not, not every applicant will, will have a very complicated permit. Okay. This also is a public hearing. Is there anyone who wants to speak in favor of this? Anyone who wants to speak against this? Okay, seeing none, is there any comments or questions for Shannon? Commissioner Burr. Uh, Shannon, uh, what w will the fees that we charge be brought before the commission to approve, or have you guys figured that out yet? The fees are in the permit now on the form, and uh, it is, I guess, my understanding, or at least my intention, is that you would approve that fee schedule, and if there were a change, it would be a commission approval again. Additional questions for Shannon? Did you have a comment? Maybe I could just add to that. What this ordinance does is it basically enacts the requirements of having a permit, uh, gives authority to charge the fees, um, makes some statements about bonding requirements, and defines a violation of the penalties. When taken with the proposed resolution, that's item 12, um, the resolution is the adoption by you of the guidebook and forms in their current form, and that sets the fee schedule. If you would like to alter those at any uh, point in time, uh, you can just pass another resolution to, to um, adopt those. Uh, revisions, if you will. So, Thanks, Kirsten. Commissioner Thanks. Bender. I'm not sure which one of you gets this question, but is it, so my understanding that this is really just a codification of an existing practice, or are we making major changes to what we've done in the past? A little bit of both. Uh, it is a formal adoption of a permitting process. Uh, we have had a very simple one-page utility permit before that charged no fee and frankly had very little requirements in terms of standardization of backfill and seating and things like that. Uh, it also gives us the right to request additional information. For example, if a water line were to cross a bridge, uh, we would want a structural analysis to say that that water line will not impair, impede, restrict uh, the use of that bridge, uh, compromise its design, carrying capacity, etc. So uh, with that, following that example, it would say you, the permittee, will have to provide us a structural engineering stamp of approval that it will not impair our bridge, or it gives us the right to hire our own engineer and charge those fees for that structural analysis back to the permittee. That's just one example of what this permit will do. Okay. Kirsten? And if I may briefly add to um, our permitting process to this point, I would argue that the broad authority delegated to the superintendent with supervision over our system gives them the authority to do this. However, to remove all debate, to remove all doubt, the enactment of the ordinance and the, and the companion resolution, I think, makes that absolutely crystal clear. So it's basically shoring up what we're doing, in my opinion. So. Okay. Additional questions for Shannon? Commissioner Byrd? So is there a penalty for doing it without the permit? They would be in violation of the law. So yes, Did, I, I would assume there is a penalty. But I put this line in ten years before you had this ordinance. Uh, That's grandfathered in. We can't we can't go backwards and retro um, require them to you know meet our new requirements based on something that was approved in the past. So I just from, uh, from here going forward, you know, some I think some of these things are easier to slip through, uh, and without any permit, it's it's done. You know, you bore the bore the highway and. Uh, you'd, you'd never know it. I mean. Well, that's true. I, I got to say that most of our utility companies are not that inclined <clears throat> to be that way. Uh, we have good working relationships with most utilities. It's it is pretty routine, run of the mill, to you know continue to provide utilities in our rights of way. So um, those practices are, are pretty well understood. Uh, so I, I really that would be the exception, Mr. Barth. Not not the not not standard by any means. Thanks. Any additional questions? Is there a motion? I have a question. Commissioner Bennigan. When you say most utilities and then you talk about, do we have any exceptions? Have we had hassles in the past with uh, utility-related issues? Uh, I personally don't know of any in my three-year tenure with the county. I do know of some funky business with water, or excuse me, drain tile. Um, 
people do that on kind of on their own and we may or may not hear about that but then when we go and do a culvert inspection it's not right so things like that happen but again not that i'm aware of that i've personally been you know happened in the last three years since i've been on board this is a public hearing and we do have someone who'd like to speak would you like to speak for or against you have to identify yourself and give your position uh, I'm Elmiron, 25935, 469th Avenue, Sioux Falls. Uh, and we do some tile work and have occasionally crossed uh, the county highways with permission, I might add. But I'm wondering a little bit about the fee schedule, first of all, so that we have some idea what this might contribute to our cost. It'll be in the next, mo it'll be in the next item on the agenda. So we'll right, discuss but I mean, the next I would, item. Yeah. But before you act on this, I think it would be good to have some idea of what that fee schedule is so that we have some idea of the cost. I have really no objection. I'm not speaking for or against this uh, uh, this item, but wondering uh, really about the about the fee structure. And uh, certainly I think that uh, uh, anybody doing this should uh, have permission and, and should not impact uh, the county and the county highways. I think in some instances and where we have worked it actually has helped the county highway because it allows the water to pass through a drainage tile rather than through the culverts that sort of thing so okay. uh, just a couple questions concerning that all right thank could, you could we i mean it's just in the Kirsten, thing it's in yeah. the white one there but kirsten uh, has a comment I'll, I'll just i'll just read them to you it's on page three of the item 12 that you'll be looking at next but uh, the type of crossing that i i believe was just referenced would be uh, since it crosses, uh, if it's a crossing one, it would be $50. And frankly, for staff time to do the review and uh, maybe go out to the site and do a site visit, um, I think it's safe saying that this is not a money maker for the county, but right. simply a partial recouping of staff effort and time. Okay. Mr. Marin. You know, that, that does sound reasonable to me. I'm just wondering what the demands might be then with respect to engineering and and uh, that possible added cost if that's, a, if that's a requirement. Because a simple crossing, I don't think, should require engineering. And I'm wondering if that's a, an option based on how the... Uh, the county highway people would view that or what might, if that's a standard requirement in all cases. Shannon, you want to answer that question, please? Standard crossings such as a utility line or even a service line that are horizontally bored, very common, very good people out in the field that do this regularly, no engineering is required, and frankly, it's a very low impact to our system. So. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions from the commission? I would look for a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, to approve that uh, the ordinance. Is there a second? A motion and a second to approve the ordinance for permitting requirements for utilities crossing highways under Minnehaha County jurisdiction. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number twelve is consider a resolution to adopt the promulgation of criteria, rules, and forms for permitting utility crossing highways under Minnehaha County jur jurisdiction. Shannon Schultz. This is this is where we have the fees and stuff. Correct. This is the continuation or the implementation of uh, having an operating permit. The fee schedule is on the permit form on the bottom of page two. And, and again, the majority of these are, are going to be the simple, very inexpensive, much like Mr. Kappenmeyer mentioned, is it's kind of a cost of paperwork and some staff time to go out and do some reviews. Uh, in addition to that, it, it does as, as the complexity and the size of the systems get larger, the impact on our staff and inspection time goes up, and some of those costs are reflected in the permit fee schedules. Uh, you will also note that anytime there's a hazardous utility uh, that has a, a crossing, you know, those fees are, are, are kind of steep. Uh, if you look at it uh, as a one time cost, it is steep, but if you look at it in terms of how often we will have to go back and repair that you know you, oftentimes you'll see a sign that says pipe in road well after 10 years the sign might as well say dip in road because the pipe forms that dip and then we have a maintenance issue so 
long term uh, that 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 those fees uh, for for repairing those is is really a, a small percentage of what we'll actually spend a lifetime of our payment but it's kind of a deterrent too. you know find another way and if this is the only way then okay we have a way to deal with it just just Question pertaining for sure. to county highways county highways only anything else state primary uh, townships no they have their own permits yep Shannon, what page is it on? Because page two is not on. Page two page for me. Page two of the permit form itself. I guess I don't have a copy of what's on oh. your uh, iPads there. No. Uh, so it would be after all Kirsten's language. Okay, I found it. It comes up on our iPads as 3 slash 107. We just have a different file. Yeah, okay. we just have a different slash. There, that's where it is, the fee schedule. Same document, though. Yeah. Any other questions on this? Madam Chair. Commissioner Burr. So, you know, should a oil pipeline uh, be routed through Minnehaha County, uh, you know, uh, what would be uh, our fee and stuff on that? That clearly would be an open trench. It would be, we'd have to restore the roadway after, or they would. Uh, that's likely going to be of a different consistency. Correct. Talk about a dip, it'd probably be... Well, frankly, the impetus uh, of this permit is, is driving from that kind of situation a small correction most of their permit or most of their their pipes are going to be horizontally bored so they're going to have bore pits uh, in a right of way and and not do an open trench so that's good mm -hmm. the bad is that that those oils are are hot and they cause the differential in temperature and so you've got a soft uh, road embankment underneath otherwise frozen and frosted uh, embedment so that's going to be continual maintenance for a long long time uh, so the fee for that exact one issue would be $250 as an occupancy plus an additional uh, $1,500 every time they cross our road. So I think the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline has an intention of eight crossings. So there would be that times eight. Okay. Any additional questions? Uh, just one more comment. We're going back to tiling. When we had our tiling task force, uh, uh, it was commented that most people tile uh, in the fog or on Christmas Day. And so hopefully we get those permits, but uh, we'll see. Is there a motion? <clears throat> there is a motion. Is there a second? A second. Motion and a second to approve the resolution to adopt the criteria rules and forms permitting utilities crossing the highways and under the county. Under Minnehaha County jurisdiction. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those in favor opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you, Shannon. Ministers. Item number 13 is authorize the chairman to sign the 200. The, 2015 state and local agreement addendum between Minnehaha County and the South Dakota Department of Emergency Management. Good morning, Commissioners and Young Emergency Management. Um, in front of you. <clears throat> is the addendum uh, for the state and local agreement uh, grant that I work with um, every year. And uh, typically you'll see this um, in the middle of September. Uh, I get a work contract with the state of South Dakota for the, the work with, that we do uh, in preparedness, response mitigation, and other emergency management efforts. Um, sometime later on in the year, and it's typically uh, about this time, uh, we actually get the funding amount uh, from them for the work that we've done. Uh, so that's why you'll see this is the addendum early, or early in the next couple of months you'll see an actual agreement for next year. Um, this year's amount is 227,360.22 which prov uh, will provide for a 50% match for up to or for salary and administrative expenses within our office. Um, it also does allow for uh, other special projects um, because that amount of 227 is greater uh, than our current salary and administrative expenses. So uh, I'll be putting a guess, uh, together a list of projects that we can use um, for the remainder of the amount. Uh, this year on our project list already is uh, would be a second uh, payment or to submit the second payment for the GIS project for the new pectometry and then also uh, to reimburse the county highway department for a reader board that they purchased earlier and both of those um, items we use uh, or can use during uh, events out in the county uh, if needed. So I'm asking the commission to authorize uh, the auditor, the chairperson and myself to enter into the agreement with the state of South Dakota. Any questions for Lynn? 
Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? second? A motion and a second to authorize the signing between the state and um, Minnehaha County. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. The next one is to authorize the chairman to sign the joint powers agreement between Minnehaha County and South Dakota Department of Game, Fish, and Parks for the use of one motor or boat, motor, trailer, and specialized equipment for public safety emergencies and search and rescue efforts in the Minnehaha County and adjacent counties. Uh, commissioners, uh, Minnehaha County has worked with the Game, Fish, and Parks for 15 plus years um, as part of our partnership uh, they uh, Minneapolis County and and uh, the game push in parks purchased some equipment together uh, that equipment is used by our volunteers started uh, the emergency management office uh, for those uses as indicated within the memo um, attached is a joint powers agreement that uh, outlines what we do what they do uh, for those and they're just asking for the agreement to be resigned it's been signed several times it's just an updated agreement um, kirsten's been uh, reviewed it and doesn't seem to have any questions uh, so i'd be willing to answer any questions and then uh, request that the commission uh, authorize the appropriate signatures for the agreement okay is there any questions for lynn is there a motion so move. Second. Motion and a second to sign the joint powers of agreement between Minneapolis County and South Dakota Department of Game, Fish, and Parks. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes Thank unanimously. Madam Chair, sure can I ask Lynn a question here? Mr. Lynn, uh, the other counties that, that you support, I know you were up at Lake Madison yep. on that recent tragedy. Um, do these other counties not have the equipment that we have? Is that, uh, or the manpower, is that the issue? Or... <clears throat> yeah, um, typically, um, you know, we generally support um, in different search and rescue missions. It all depends, but um, Lincoln County, uh, Turner County, McCook, Lake, and Moody, and then we do uh, go out into further areas, and they just don't have the manpower or the equipment. And, um, you know, in this recent event, the individual that uh, was a victim there was a resident of Minneapolis County and, and uh, Sioux Falls, so... Uh, you know, with our population base, the way they get out and do some of the things, um, you know, it's really been the uh, thoughts of the commission that we support them here, but we also support them when they go outside of the area as long as it's uh, within reason and it's not following our citizens to on a day-to-day on a -day basis or even a month-to-month -month basis to Rapid City or other areas. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank Item you. number 15 is consider a motion to supplement the 1700 $726 from the building fund to the building fund budget, ASN 19633, outside repairs, representing insurance reimbursement from the State Farm Fire and Casualty Company. Kim Adamson. Good morning, Commissioners. Kim Adamson from the Auditor's Office. Um, this is just a supplement to for the insurance proceeds from damage to the chain link fence over in parking lot H. Okay. And we discussed that in building fund this morning. So Correct. Move approval. Second. second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Item number 16 is consider a motion to authorize the sales order agreement between Minneapolis County and ES and S electronic and election systems and software for the purchase of one DS. 850 high speed digital Im imaging scanning ballot counter in the amount of $109,387.50 utilizing Help America Vote Act to have a funds administered by the South Dakota State Secretary of State, Bob Litz. Now, good morning, Commission Bob Litz from the Elections Department downstairs. Auditor's office would like to purchase a third DS850 ballot tabulation machine this fall. The reason we'd like to purchase it now is we want to perform acceptance testing procedures as well as practice with the machine and compare the results with our other DS, our other two DS850s that the Elections Department currently has. I've negotiated over $10,000 in uh, savings for the purchase, installation, refresher training, shipping, and handling of the contract. I've also negotiated on-site election support to be president in Minnehaha County for the 2016 open presidential election, which I might add will be, uh, we'll have a school city election uh, April 12th, 2016, then we'll have a primary in June 4th. Those will come first, but even if, uh, I, I, think I feel safe with those there, but the presidential election, I'd like to have that help on standby. <clears throat> 
The total price of the contract I'm requesting today will be $109,387. Uh, $1.50. It will be repaid by HAVA funds administered by the Secretary of State. That will leave our current HAVA balance at $450,803.50. The action that I'm requesting today is for the Commission to approve of and the chairperson to sign the two copies of the contract attached. The Civil State's Attorney's Office has inspected the document and finds no detriment to the county in the purchase. Are there any questions for Bob? Commissioner Benegaff. Bob, I was just wondering, is there a uh, ratio that people used on how many machines you should have versus the number of votes that are uh, presented? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because before the last election, we did uh, 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 kind of a, a numbers thing on how many ballots we thought we would have <coughs> as opposed to the machines that we would need to do it. And I was assured by a couple of people, one of them from ES and S and another one from C change, that two of them would do the job. Uh, but about an hour into the election, uh, last time it became apparent to me that that was not the case. Do they make other recommendations in reference to the kind of equipment that you have and all that good stuff? Uh, no, I, they, they really don't. Uh, you know, they kind of leave you to make the decisions on your own. And I think that uh, uh, with this third machine, we'll be well equipped to handle this next election, the next presidential election. I'm, I'm figured probably going to have 90,000 plus ballots. 20,000 of those are probably going to be absentees. And we are also going to count the absentees starting in the morning. We're going to start running those through one of the machines. Uh, and actually, if you do that, you're, you're actually conducting two elections throughout the day because each of the absentee precincts will be counted as one. And then later on, as you run the other uh, uh, precincts through when they come in with the ballot boxes, you're going to have to add those totals in there again. Uh, so, you know, it, it just became apparent to me with the way the sensitivity of these machines last time with that election, uh, that, that the way they kicked them out, number one, I didn't have enough... Uh, uh, resolution boards, and number two, I could have used that third machine. The other magic question is space-related issues for not only the machine but the board itself. You know, I, I, we we came up and did an assessment of this room, the room there, uh, and, and we're going to actually have to close off part of this hallway. And then downstairs, uh, where the ballot tabulation machines are too, we're going to have to close off part of that hallway as well in order to do that. Uh, we had did some did some rearranging of the way we did things. Uh, we brought the ballots in, just the traffic pattern for which things moved, and it seemed to work pretty good. Of course, 15,000 ballots, of course, you know, as opposed to 90,000. Well, you know, that's it's it's kind of like having a race car where you tune it up in the garage and then you take it out to the track. You know, we're we're just going to have to find some of these things out. Uh, but by buying this third machine. Uh, we're gonna. We've got some acceptance testing methods that we're gonna do before we even pay for the machine to find out number one if it's functioning properly, and then we're also gonna do a lot of training on those machines in the off season with all three of them and compare the results. Uh, as far as the space needs go, you know, I, I, I and I, I talked to uh, Commissioner Heiberger a little bit about this. You know, the, uh, I'd like to. Uh, maybe move over everything over to the Coliseum and have the election kind of center thing there. I, I, in some respects, it would work very well. Uh, in other respects, uh, taking those sensitive machines over there in November might be problematic. Uh, I think dropping the ballot boxes off afterwards would be fine. I think that uh, having the people that open the absentee ballots normally that are in this room and, and where we've made those offices, that could be conducted over there. It would be nice to have it all in one place. Uh, you know, I think there's uh, probably some security concerns over there, but I would add that uh, when I went to go look at that building here a while back, uh, it, it took me two phone calls and I had to go through two people to get into the place. Uh, so, you know, I think the security concerns for the Coliseum could be, uh, could be handled. But, you know, uh, that, that's, that's an option I'd like to think about a little bit. But we can also do it, I think, just by closing some of this hallway off and getting some signs made that indicate that you know, egress and ingress is uh, for authorized personnel only, except in the case of fire, because I, I think we may have some issues there if I don't at least have that type of signage up. And there would be a passageway in between here to get, you know, in and out. Obviously, I've got to get people in and out of there as well. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to think about. Uh, you know, like I say, it would be kind of nice to have everything in one room over there at the Coliseum. Uh, but uh, getting those machines over there, I'd probably have to get them over there a couple of weeks early, uh, make sure they're acclimated, make sure I've got all the power things set up, make sure I've got all the tables set up and all the chairs set up and everything that we need to conduct an election. It's just a thought. 
uh, you know, like I say, we've got the space in here. It'll be tight. I struggle with this. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was out in Pennington County, and she's got three full-time workers on elections, but in fairness to her, she does conduct all of the cities, uh, you know, with uh, all of the school district that's within the, the city district, and she conducts the city elections, everything about it. So she probably has a little bit of an enterprise fund there to pay those things back. Uh, on my recent trip out to Lake Havasu City, Arizona, I went up to Mojave County uh, because that election director, coordinator, he's thinking about buying some of these machines and wanted to talk to me about them and so I went up there and shared our experiences and, and, and things like that and he was appreciative and in the process he also showed me around and they've dedicated a lot of space to elections out there now um, you know we've got to, I've got to be realistic about this and understand that our elections happen you know occasionally and if we can just make things work I think that's good enough uh, but you know the Coliseum idea I guess is intriguing me so Additional questions, Commissioner Kelly? Well, Bob, I think the Coliseum, yeah, it is intriguing. Um, you'd only have to do it during presidential years, probably, because that's your maximum turnout, isn't it? For That, that for is the big one. And this will be an open presidential, which will yeah, increase the turnout even, even more. more. Uh, I just, yeah, I think you got to continue to pursue that, because uh, to me, that would, it, tight quarters make for mistakes. and. There you could really lay it out as it should be and, and have everybody where they're supposed to be. And well, and as I think about the uh, the precincts returning, you know, a lot of times we'll, we'll have them jammed up here in the parking lot, kind of out in 6th Street, depending on qu how quickly the Boy Scouts do. But we could we could certainly have that lane uh, on Main Avenue, uh, you know, put up some no parking signs and just get the cars to come out there. So it would be the same bottleneck, whether it's on Main Avenue or out here. And I notice the traffic at night out on Main Avenue, it's not very heavy, uh, you know, most nights. So. Madam Chair. Commissioner Barr. I, I plan to uh, support this purchase, and I know I don't know if it was during the election panel or what, but I think Monty said that if we want to have two functional machines, we should have three, uh, you know, total. And so I think if we'd had three in this last election, we could have done a lot better. And uh, so I I plan to support this, and uh, yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, okay. make this purchase if. I have a motion to um, to authorize the sales order agreement between Minnehaha County and ESNS. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion, a second. Any additional questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Thank Commission. You, it will uh, arrive here uh, first part of September. Item number 17 is Minnehaha County liaison reports. Are there any reports? Commissioner Kelly? Um, I believe it's the last week on... Tuesday night they had the public hearing, or was it Wednesday? I don't know. What? Anyway, I went to the public hearing after, yeah, it was Tuesday, after our joint hearing, or joint meeting. And I think a good share of the people that are affected by this thing out north on the, on the FEMA designations um, were there. They, they had a tendency to to blame the city's diversion of what the city did. The experts there continued to say no, that that had no bearing on it. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if anybody left the meeting happy. Uh, but anyway, so I, I called in next day or two, and he was kind enough to give me a tour of Ditch Road, which I saw areas of this county I have never ever been in, and and this ditch. I I, I really I knew there was like a little strip between Renner and uh, uh, and I ninety, but boy, I mean, there's a lot of road there. Uh, one of the things that Lynn pointed out, and it, one of the things that seems to be a block in the at least in the spring flooding, is when the ice jams up at the I ninety bridge. And, of course, you know, that would be next to impossible probably to ever get the government to replace that bridge with a longer bridge so that they had more space in there. But um, one question is nobody seems to know who owns the ditch, and so nobody's maintaining it, and it is absolutely full of debris, trees down, everything else. and. Um, I, I think it's something maybe should be looked at because there's still a hundred people out there that are going to be paying more for their 
that, that they never expect it because they've never been in the floodplain. Most of them say they've never been flooded. But, you know, you've got the 1% or 2% flood possibility that uh, FEMA's looking at. So uh, I would suggest if you have any questions on it to get a hold of Lynn because it is an eye-opener. In the meantime, it would be interesting to do some research to find out who's responsible for that ditch. We did have that as a planning and zoning of a couple years ago about Ditch Road. And does somebody remember? I don't know that I want to say what I remember if in case well, I'm wrong. If I may, uh, what I remember is that this ditch is uh, one of those projects of our drainage district, just like the pipe projects that uh, we've had up by Colton and Humboldt. It was built by a drainage district, which uh, after it was completed, it became defunct. Uh, and that was in the 1920s. I think it was the responsibility of the people that were bordering that ditch to to yep. keep it cleaned out. We talked about this on, when we had a barn up in that area around Baltic is when it came up mm -hmm. a few years ago. And we did talk about the fact that it is full and it needs to be oh, cleaned. Oh, it's terrible. But I yeah. believe it was the, the property owners in that area were responsible for cleaning out their own ditches. The same thing happens when the old drains uh, blow out in a field and makes a hole the size of this room. That farmer is stuck with the, with the problem. Well, I, I do think we owe it to our constituents up there that, that are in the county that are not, you know, the, the city picked up, I don't know, 11, 1200, whatever it was, <laughs> properties off of the floodplain, and th those insurance premiums can be very significant, as I understand. And uh, uh, I, I think we've got to continue to take care of those people north of the city limits. The, and if, if there's some stuff that should be done that isn't being done either by us or by the drainage district or whatever, I think we should approach it. Even if you had to go to a, back to the drainage district and back to the property owners, because obviously it'll benefit them if you get it cleaned out. Or the engineers at least should look at it. I don't know. Scott, could I ask you to come up just a second? Is that something that planning and zoning could look into and just report back to us? I know at that meeting that we had with the city, they did say that there might be ways to mitigate some of those issues. And There are mitigation uh, options, and I, I can look into that. Um, the um, As Commissioner Barth in, indicated, that he's 100% correct. That drainage district was set up in the 20s, I believe, uh, and... They constructed the ditch along Ditch Road, and it is defunct. There is no drainage district that is operable anymore or, or even functioning. So, um, you know, one option would be for those people, all of the people along Ditch Creek, to reform that, all the property owners, and basically take over the maintenance and the upkeep of that ditch, which is... A, you know, you have to have a wide participation, and that just is hard to come by. Um, there are maybe other mitigations. We had also uh, neighbors uh, from those Swanson tracks that brought in some information at the meeting on uh, Tuesday night at the public open house of the library about um, a road that is not used on the underneath the interstate on the west side of the interstate, um, an agricultural road that could, potentially could be taken out. Um, and that may open up the, the channel a little bit of, of the Big Sioux. But, um, uh, I, and I did talk to Lynn DeYoung about this, uh, I think Wednesday or Thursday. The mitigation projects that are available, they, there's a, there's a co-funding, there's a, 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 you know, a share, a cost sharing that has to be done where the, the county may have to pay 25% of that and um, then FEMA or the state emergency management could potentially pay for that based on their ranking system of, of a project. I would have no idea what that would cost. I can't imagine it would be very cheap, and we would have to come up with a 25% match. To me, I think maybe emergency management and planning should at least look and see what some of those solutions are. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think we that. need to continue to look into it and at least tell those people out there we're doing something, we're, we're looking. It, look how long. It took. I think I was on the commission or the council when we did started on that drainage, that whole west side air drainage deal. <coughs> and it took, what, 15 years nearly to, to complete that. So. 
I'm not any un, any under any delusion that you can do this quickly. So could you just talk to Lynn and yeah. see what what's a time frame for us, and maybe get back to our office about what you think you'd need to just at least look into some ideas. We, we can look into it, and I can get it. I can get a better idea of the. Uh, the, pro the exact process of when they take applications for the mitigation projects, the exact amount, and how it's ranked. Okay. Um, uh, I, I can prepare that information and get it to you. Um, one of the other things that um, Commissioner Kelly did point out, or that is important, he attended the meeting on Tuesday night. It is important, and we will be sending out, I will, my office will be sending out notices to all of the property owners up there because the takeaway, the most important takeaway of that meeting was get your insurance, get your insurance now and you're going to be grandfathered in. And you have to have that insurance in place at least 30 days prior to those maps going into effect. We don't know ex the exact effective date or when those maps will, will be officially adopted. They're dated June 26th. But it's about another year and a couple months before they become effective. And my intent is to follow this closely. Probably next year about this time, start sending out letters to all the affected property owners and tell them it is important if you want to obtain the cheapest rate for your flood insurance that you lock it in at least 30 days prior to this date. And, and that's one of the out outreach that we will be doing to, for those citizens up there because it is 100 people. and. And that, as Dick Ellis <coughs> indicated, that insurance is not, cannot, is it's not cheap. Yes. I have yes. a question for Kirsten. Kelly. <clears throat> the drainage district was formed. Correct. Was it ever officially unformed? I, I think what happened is by operation of them not doing the regular meetings, it was officially disbanded once they uh, failed to hold those required meetings. But where the responsibility lies after that, I think, is an open question. And to form a drainage district up there that included all that north, you know, in fact, even the ones that are getting flooded now that perhaps wouldn't with yeah. clearing out a ditch road uh, or ditch the ditch, yeah. uh, can that happen or do the residents have to form it? I'd have to look at that okay. question yeah. specifically of whether that can be can be brought in over your own objections. Um, and I don't know what the boundaries of that prior district were even. I'd have to look at that as well, where where the definition ended. Commissioner Barth. Um, th thank you. Uh, I believe there were 14 drainage districts of this nature in the county, and the auditor may still have some record on it. But I'd like to go back to what Scott was just saying about getting our insurance uh, uh, ahead of the re- uh, the the posting of the FEMA floodplain. I wonder if we should send out a press release on that to uh, to you know I th I may have heard it in the original coverage, but mm -hmm. the Swiss cheese I call I call a brain uh, let it pass without registering. So I wonder if we need to make an extra effort to get the word out on that. I think Scott just said that he is making the extra effort and he's working on that. Okay. And, uh, I I think that the timing, it, if we send it out now, a uh, press release is going to be lost. I think we mm -hmm. need to send it out next June, mm -hmm. July, a little closer to the dates because then you're likely to take further action. Thank you. Mr. Litz, did you have a comment? No, I just wanted to comment. The auditor's office does have some of the old uh, ditch bond records down there and uh, drawings, their hand, their hand drawings of, of a lot of these old districts, and uh, I could poke around down there and see what I could find out for you. Okay. Maybe for emergency management and planning. So, Any other comments on that subject? I have a... Um, Commissioner Barth, you have a comment? Uh, it's on my Please, liaison. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I handed out, <clears throat> uh, we had a, in our homeless advisory board yesterday, the city did a presentation on their efforts in affordable housing. And in the small brochure that came out with it, they identify the, the numerous projects that they've put in. Uh, for example, uh, owner units modified for accessibility, 11 projects for $37,000. Uh, new households assisted in 2014 for Heartland House. There were 37 of them. Uh, rental rehabilitation projects. In any case, uh, under the mayor, uh, the spending on, uh, on uh, affordable housing has increased 
since he took over. I don't know that that's all city money, but I know that it's uh, efforts that uh, I welcome and are helping keeping people in their homes, uh, which is uh, one of the priorities for the uh, Homeless Advisory Board now, preventing people from becoming homeless, keeping them in their homes, uh, is, uh, uh, and the city's doing, uh, is helping. Okay. And I have one liaison report, and that was that I met with the senior project director for the Forward Sioux Falls and had an interview this past week. Um, and amongst many questions at the end, we kind of talked about what their goal is, and their goal is $17 million this year. We talked about what the counties has contributed over the last five years and told them we had not decided for sure on that number. I think we'll be discussing that again in September when we do our final budget review. Um, we did talk about where we had pledged before, uh, I think $500 a year, that we could change our pledges midstream in that five years if we wanted to start out with more, if we had more. Um, and then it came the next year, we couldn't actually make that. So that was some conversation about um, about maybe some flexibility, re realizing the budget constraints that Minnehaha County has. So that will be a conversation for the future. Are there any other liaison reports? Is there any new business? Is there any old business? For a motion to adjourn to executive session for personnel and possible lit uh, potential litigation. So All those in favor? Second. A second. Motion a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. We are adjourned.